good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, well, I think I should just say good day, everyone. I am Priya Patra, Vice President Outreach of the PMI Mumbai Chapter. I am the host of the session today. And of course, we have our chapter exchange chapter leaders also on this uh, panel assisting me with by making to make this event as successful as ever. So we have Anita from PMI Poland chapter. Hi everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Greetings from Wrocław in Poland. And uh, we have our Asia Pacific champion Tao from PMI Taiwan chapter. Hello everyone, I'm Tao, Taiwan chapter. All right, and Shane from PMI Phoenix chapter. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Good morning, Shane. Is it 5.30 a.m. there right now? <clears throat> nope, it's 7. Okay, not so bad. <laughs> and Christina, PMI Netherlands chapter. Christina, are you talking on mute? All right, so we will move on to Damike, who is our chapter leader from PMI Sri Lanka chapter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. And our Latin America champion, Priscilla from PMI South for the Brazil chapter. Hello from Brazil. And over to you, Priscilla. Thank you. So welcome again to PMI chapter exchange season four, event nine. Today, we are going to discuss project management and the future of work. Today, we have our PMI friends joining in from 26 different PMI chapters from across the globe, North America, Latin America, Europe, Asia, Africa, plus many more supporting chapters from the globe. It is always exciting to present our exchange effect map. We, we have actually maxed out our registrations that came from 59 countries. We invite you now to keep saying hello to each other and networking as we begin this exciting event. Today, we are pleased to announce that we have over 1,000 registrations from all over the world, 59 countries as mentioned before, from Alaska to New Zealand and all countries and continents in between. And please, we would like to ask you to let us know where you are coming from using the main link shared in the chat. It is important to remind you that this meeting is being recorded. So if you feel uncomfortable in any way, you can choose not to attend. If not, you are welcome to continue. We also highlight that everyone here at this event is speaking in our individual capacity. Then our opinions do not represent the opinions of our organizations in any way. And like we did in the last event, we will also spotlight you. How? Here are the rules. Participate actively in the event using the chat window. Share an interesting quote or comment on the topic or on this chapter exchange event. And then in the end of the event, we will spotlight you. Plus you and your quotes or comments will be published in our attendee spotlight section in our inside exchange nugget. So gear up and share your quote with us in the chat window. Thank you. Over to you, Damike. Uh, thank you, Priscilla. So, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our guest speaker of the day, Dr. Harold Kirsner. Dr. Kirsner is a senior executive director with International Institute of Learning Incorporation and Professor Emirates of Systems Management at Baldwin Wallace University. Dr. Kirsner is an expert in the areas of project, program, program and, portfolio and portfolio management. 
and strategic planning, and he is also distinguished author in project management. Dr. Kirzner has experience spanning across multiple domains, chemical, oil and gas, banking, pharmaceutical, IT, to name a few. He is highly skilled in delivering training across topics and industries, customizing methodology to align with organizational needs, designing curricula to address learning needs of organizations, coaching and mentoring project center of excellence and senior teams. Without much, I'm going to uh, hand over the stage to uh, Dr. Harrell. Over to you. Thank you. Tell me, if you're a project manager, what are you managing? That sounds like a terrible question, right? Well, the answer is you're not managing projects today. You're managing part of a business. Project managers have been converted into business managers. We are now asking project managers to manage strategic projects rather than just traditional projects. For more than 30 years, the type of project that most project managers managed were projects that started out with well-defined business cases, well-defined statements of work, a work breakdown structure that you could take down to level six, seven, or eight for the duration of the project. Today, we're asking you to manage strategic projects. Those projects begin with an idea. Who managed these projects traditionally? These projects were managed traditionally by functional managers, not project managers. Executives have come to the realization it didn't work well letting functional managers manage the strategic projects. Why? Because functional managers were getting year-end bonuses. If you get a year-end bonus, where will you put your best resources? On the strategic projects that impact the future of the company or the short-term projects that impact your Christmas bonus? So now we're asking project managers to take control of these strategic projects. The result is very, very challenging because in many companies, as much as 50 or 60 or 70 percent of these projects do not give us the benefits and value we expected. We're being challenged. We have new metrics. Forget about time, cost, and scope. We now have 30, 40, 50 other metrics on projects. We now have assumptions we've never worked with before. Business assumptions. Project managers now must make business decisions. You can no longer rely upon the project sponsor or the governance people to always make these decisions. It's not the fact that the people on the project team are poor workers. It's the fact that we're initiating a lot of these strategic projects with just an idea rather than a fully developed business case. One of the things we're asking executives to do when they approve a project and assign a priority is to tell us What's the success and failure criteria? What's the criteria for us to stop working on that project and pull the plug and assign the resources somewhere else? Most project managers don't know when a strategic project is over, when they should stop working on it. This must be told to them by senior management. Historically, how did we do it? Senior management would meet in a closed room by themselves. They would select a project. They would assign a priority. And then they'd appoint the project manager and they'd say, here's your project, take it and execute it. Or we'll put you into teaching with Dr. Kirsten at IIL. That's where you'll end up. Now we're asking project managers to participate in the front end 
to understand the thought process that went into the selection of that project. Most project managers are never allowed to participate in the front end. They're handed a business case and they're told execute. We now have value metrics. We now have methodologies such as Agile, Scrum, hybrid methodologies. Why? Because the waterfall approach was not very good at managing strategic projects. Hybrid methodologies, Agile, Scrum. What's the single most important word in those methodologies? If I asked you to pick one word and only one word that describes those methodologies, what would you pick? The word that I pick is collaboration. It allows you to collaborate with everybody involved in the project team, especially, especially stakeholders. We are now inviting stakeholders to participate in critical decisions on projects. Do you know that years ago in training classes, we taught project managers never to talk to the sponsor or to the stakeholders unless it was absolutely necessary because they will meddle. They'll interfere with the project and start making changes. Now we're saying we welcome their input as long as they understand project management and they can help us make the right decisions. Take a look at the training courses we offered 10 years ago and look at the training courses that are offered today in companies. Look at what they're focusing on. Agile, Scrum, hybrid methodologies, collaboration. Do you know what the biggest weakness was? The single biggest weakness in most project management textbooks for almost 50 years, leadership. We did a terrible job discussing leadership. Now we're finally looking at what's meant by effective leadership and how do you engage the workers and keep them informed. I'll tell you one story and then I'll turn it back to Spencer. One of the things we're teaching project managers today is when you engage people on the project team, they have expectations. They don't want to work for a project manager that expects them to spend 30, 40, 50 hours a week in overtime and completely give up their home life, the fact that they have a family and children. We want project managers that take an interest in the workers and care about the workers. PMI and IIL give out an award to one project manager in the world once a year. I'm very, very pleased the award is actually in my name. One of the project managers that got that award several years ago got the award for turning around the failing project. He took over a project that was failing. He was the third project manager that took over that project. The first project manager was fired. The second project manager was a friend of his. He watched his friend removed from the building in an ambulance. He then told everyone on the team, this is not going to happen to me. He looked at the project team and he said, you people are under tremendous pressure. You're under stress. You're working tremendous overtime. I want you to stop working on this project for at least two weeks. I want you to go home and spend time with the family. What you have at home is more important than any project in this company. Two weeks later, the entire team showed up in his office and said, what can we do to help you turn around this failing project? And they did. That project was turned around. It became a complete success. This is what we're talking about today taking an interest in the people in the project. I'm a terrible project manager, at least I was. Do you know how I treated people 30, 40, 50 years ago? I didn't treat them by their names. 
I treated them by their badge number and how much money they were charging my project. My goal was to get them off of my project as quickly as possible because of all the money they were charging. I didn't care about the people. All of that has changed and it's now part of the new type of leadership style that we're expecting project managers to learn, especially on these challenging strategic projects. Spencer, I'll turn it over to you. Well, Thank you, Dr. Harold. Well, I think somebody else is speaking first. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Spencer, it is my turn. Um, That's right. I'll give you the spotlight in a few minutes. Just give me my share of my spotlight, right? Okay, so I'm sharing my screen again. Thank you, Dr. Kresner, for the wonderful, uh, you know, the keynote, small keynote, but an impactful one. Yes, we do have a panelist, Mario, who was supposed to join. He is the Dr. Harold Kresner Award winner, uh, project manager, but unfortunately, there is some power cut and some storms going on there, and he's unable to join today. But nevertheless, thank you very much, Dr. Kresner, for that impactful and short message. And uh, before we move on, this is what our program is all about. And we try like to call it one team, one song and one dance. We have 26 partnering chapters. The logos are there on the screen. And um, the, in fact, we are present in all the regions that PMI is in today, isn't it? And uh, PMI Chapter Action is nothing but a virtual community of chapter leaders. And trust me, when we started in 2020, I didn't know. In fact, we had never met each other, but we continued for two years until last year, where we got a chance to meet each other in person. And also last uh, month when we were in the Global Summit in Atlanta. So it's all about uh, virtual collaboration. Our vision is to evangelize chapter collaboration and encourage cultural diversity. Uh, we co-create these monthly events to bring in diverse perspectives to our chapter members, spurring networking opportunities and collaboration opportunities, of course. And by doing this, we are building a community to share good practices within and external to the program. And that is why we have not kept the secret here. We have even published a book. And this is this book, which we call this as an exchange effect. And it is about, we, we, we like to call it as a phenomenon where diverse connections lead to innovative solutions uh, with a compounding effect, one diverse connection at a time. And uh, the learnings are all documented in this book. It is available on Amazon. And Priscilla will put the link on the chat window in case you want to, uh, you know, read it. It is free for download for Kindle as well. So yes, um, this is all our learnings. It's a collaborative effort again. And uh, please have a look at it and let us know what you think. And with this, over to you, Damike, to introduce the Spotlight chapter of the event. Uh, thanks, Priya. Let me introduce Thomas, the president of PMI Poland chapter. Thomas tagline on LinkedIn says, keep people inspired. He's a seasoned agile and project management specialist, successfully spreadheaded numerous organizational transformations, refining project methodologies, and seamlessly integrating Agile practices such as Scrum, Kanban, Scrum at Scale, and Helix organization. His expertise extend to aiding organizations in crafting forward thinking, human-centric management models. He is also host of the Project Nonia podcast, produced in association with the PMI Poland chapter, reflecting his commitment to the evolution and enhancement of project management. On a personal note, his passion for cave diving, diving uh, mirrors, both are realm which where he continuously strive for excellence and boundary pushing. Before I hand over the stage to you, I have two questions. What is the time they are now at your side and the date? What does the logo of your chapter signify? Two 
Over to you, Thomas. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much and, and good day to uh, to everyone. Uh, the logo. The logo is just the geographical shape of the country. So we are trying to make it easy. So it's as simple as that. And of course, it's a part of a global PMI uh, logo. Yeah. And, and what, what was the first question? Uh, the time and the date they are in Poland now. Oh, the time, it's uh, 3.25 p.m., so earlier than in India right now. Yeah. Okay, my friends, uh, let me tell you a story, a short story about extraordinary people and remarkable team, the PMI Poland chapter. This tale I want to share, it's, it's not just about project management, but about making significant social impact and shaping the future. Over a decade ago, we embarked on a journey to empower young minds, especially those from challenging environments. Um, one of our flagship initiatives, the Kids Camps, has been a beacon of hope for many young kids, offering them a chance to learn grow and believe in a brighter future. Of course, our story doesn't end here with kids. We realized the importance of nurturing the next generation of project managers. To address this, we formed a dedicated team within our chapter, their mission, to boost the prospects of the young generation in the project management area. Uh, one of our notable achievements uh, in this area is the University Project Management Games, an innovative, I think in Europe or maybe in the world, an innovative and engaging platform for students to own their skills. Our co commitment to excellence is further reflected in the numerous large scale conferences we organize each year. I think this year we had five or six quite huge conferences. And the highlight is our annual international congress in Warsaw uh, next week, actually, an event that not only showcases our expertise, but also brings together international minds. Uh, in pursuing knowledge sharing, we took a significant step by translating the PMBOK version 7 into Polish. This endeavor has not only enhanced our local project management community, but also bridged language barriers, making knowledge more accessible. Uh, but at the heart of our chapter lies the spirit of community and trust. This is very, very important and personal to myself, we believe in not just working together, but also in celebrating together. Uh, these, these moments of joy and camaraderie where, um, we ma which makes us more than a team, actually they make us a family, I believe. And our mentoring program, uh, now it's seventh edition, is a testament to our commitment to personal and professional growth. Uh, it's one, it's another flagship initiative of PMI Poland chapter. Uh, it's a platform where experience meets enthusiasm, where mentors and mentees together chart new paths in project management. This year, uh, 2023, we are celebrating two significant milestones the 20th anniversary of our chapter and the 10th anniversary of our quarterly magazine, Strefa PMI. These landmarks are not just numbers, they are, I believe, symbols of enduring dedication and, and uh, evolving journey. And finally, I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the volunteers worldwide, to all of you here, because your selfless commitment is changing the world for the better. Together, as volunteers, we are not only just making projects, we are shaping a better future. So thank you for being part of this incredible journey. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, what a wonderful way to start the, uh, start the talk. Let me tell you a story. You captivated us, for sure. And yeah, the Strefa PMI, Poland, I know it. I, I did give an interview. It's a wonderful uh, magazine. Please, everyone on this call, 
I encourage you to read that magazine. Reach out to Anita if you want to be featured in that magazine. Sorry, Anita, I took the li liberty of inviting everyone. OK, so I think without further ado, we will move on to the next section. And Damiki, over to you to Anita, over to you to introduce the moderator of the day. Yes. Thank you, Tomasz, for presentation about Poland's chapter, and thank you, Priya, for inviting everyone to Strefa PMI. I'm more than happy to pro conduct more interviews if you're interested. And I'm very thrilled to introduce you to our session moderator, the one and only Spencer Horn. Um, let me tell you a little um, a little behind uh, Spencer's story. Uh, so I know that the thing that Spencer is most proud of in his life is his family. Um, Spencer, you have been married for 37 years, as we know, to the love of your life. And uh, your wife is a partner and COO of Altium Leadership. Uh, we know that together you have uh, five children, and if I'm counting right, you're soon to have um, eight grandchildren. Big congrats to that, Spencer. And uh, what I also know personally about you is that you love the outdoors, hiking and riding your bike. And on top of that, you love to learn. Uh, Spencer has a uh, MS in economics from the University of Utah. Uh, he is a certified speaking professional with National Speakers Association, which is a designation which less than 17% of NSA speakers and 6% of all speakers worldwide achieve. Spencer is executive coach a certified team performance coach and licensed behavior analyst. Uh, Spencer has also worked with major organizations like National Geographic, Radio City Music, Music Productions and more. He developed IMAX theaters in partnership with several companies, including National Geographic Television and more, where he managed complex projects. Spencer has been speaking professionally for 15 years and Spencer you're very well known in our PMI world as you have been presenting at multiple PMI chapter development conferences since I believe 2010 and also you have been a regular speaker at PMI Leadership Institute meeting North America conference since 2014 and on top of that Spencer was consistently one of the highest rated speakers for the year-long PMI LIMC which is Leadership Institute Masterclass from 2015 to 2025. What is more, Spencer understands the importance of project management to organizations and economy, and his goal today is to help you take greater responsibility for your success and satisfaction as project manager, professional, and in your personal life. That's amazing bio, Spencer. I hand over the stage to you. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Oh my goodness. So huge gratitude. Thank you, Anetta, for that, that great introduction. I am so excited to be with you all around the world today. I want you to think back to where you were in 2019, 2019, just four years ago. How did your view of the future of project management differ than it does today? Well, back in 2019, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development made a bold forecast. They said that in the next 15 to 20 years, it is predicted that new automation technologies will likely eliminate 14% of the world's jobs and radically transform the other 32%. That was before 
we had things like chat GPT and other generative AI explode into the marketplace as we have in this last little, these last few years. We have with us today assembled a panel of incredible thought leaders that are going to answer your questions. And we are going to hit this hard. We're going to hit this fast. They are, they have come prepared to play today to answer your questions about the future of work. Your job as participants, whatever it is you're doing, stop that and get focused on, on these panelists because I, we want to hear your concerns. We want to hear your questions. Do you believe that those project predictions were accurate? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? We're going to be digging in and talking. We're going to answer these questions fast and furious. And I want to, I have the pleasure of introducing our panel, which I will do now very quickly, starting with the incredible Amani Nusebe. And she is coming to us from PMI Sydney and, and a PMI Australia fellow, a PMP, and she is a veteran of the enterprise PMO, which is so important in, in the project management world. Portfolio program and project management consultant, director of uh, optimal consulting. And she has been a chief portfolio officer, a, a portfolio manager, program manager, and of course, project manager. So she brings an incredible wealth of experience. She has delivered complex, large scale portfolios, programs, and projects for organizations like Contus, CSC Australia, BHP, uh, uh, Billiton, Blue Scope Steel, Vodafone, University of New South Wales, where, by the way, she earned her master's of technology and business. Did I get that right, Amini, if, if I recall? Uh, so your alma mater loved you so much they hired you. That's that's amazing. Uh, she's a long-term PMI volunteer. She is part of the uh, a co-chair of the PMI Ethics Memory Advisory Group. So we'd love to hear her comments on on the uh, influence of, of ethics when we get into all this generative technology. Past president of PMI Sydney as a guest lecturer, speaker, facilitator, just so much incredible experience I can go on and on. So welcome, Amini. Thank you, Spencer, for this very generous introduction. Thank you. And next we have Joanna Agiapong Aguiare. Did I say that correct, Joanna? You did great. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I've had the chance to meet with Joanna, a lovely, amazing, uh, experienced uh, project manager. She has 18 years of experience in banking and project management. She's worked in the Ghanaian banking industry for 14 years in the following roles, supervisor, head office operations, team lead, corporate and institutional banking, and head of corporate project finance. And she's a certified project management professional and a member of the Project Management Institute Ghana chapter. She has served as a volunteer for the Ghana chapter as Director of Communications, Media and Public Relations from 2020 to 22. She's currently the lead for the banking and finance think tank for the Ghana chapter of uh, PMI Ghana chapter. And she works currently with PricewaterhouseCoopers in, in Ghana and as a project coordinating director for receivership projects. Joanna holds an LLM in finance from the Institute of Law and Finance from the Goethe University of Frankfurt, Germany. How many languages do you speak, Joanna? I, I don't want to disappoint you, Spencer. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> ask. <laughs> I, you can never disappoint me. And she has a master's of business administration. So as we were listening to Dr. Harold, you know, this is this is where the industry is is going. Having this business experience is so valuable, and she brings that. And as a BA uh, in law uh, and English from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Ghana. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you, Spencer, for your kind introduction. Thank you. Oh, I'm so I'm glad to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nadun Gomes is coming to us from Sri Lanka, who has 27 years of banking and finance industry, over 15 years of experience in project management, implementing financial systems, supporting retail and corporate banking, which includes understanding of uh, complex project objectives, generating project scope, documentation, analyzing the business requirements and preparation for RFP documents and vendor selection, all of that. 
So just a tremendous amount of experience working with software engineers, vendors, and subject matter uh, experts, matter experts in both business and or operations. He has a lot of experience opening new branches, accounting uh, amounting to a hundred plus new branch branches, adding up to a network of 250 branches as to this date. Uh, overall knowledge on branch infrastructure readiness, staffing and training, opening assistance. So, so much about working with people, which as we have heard, getting people to work together in these new operations is a huge part of his experience, which is so important in today's project uh, uh, operations. Currently, he's heading the IT project management office of Hatton National Bank, PLC, Sri Lanka since 2018. And he's responsible for managing the IT project portfolio, ensuring the project deliveries within allotted budget and scope, and also ensuring quality of the project and quality of life, I know. So he's got over 10 years of hands-on experience in conducting training to banking staff, so he brings that to this table. We're so glad to have you, Nadun. Welcome. Thank you, Spencer, for the introduction. Lovely. Wonderful, thank you. And now we have Yolanda Cabrera Sibesma, who is coming to us from the Netherlands, and she is the Chief Executive Officer of Sintil Pharma BV. And she just, I'm so excited to have uh, all of you on this. And, and Yolanda, I, I love your perspective. She has lived so many places around the world, but her organization is based in the Netherlands. And she is a dynamic chief executive officer. I so enjoyed just getting to know you a little bit. And as a founder, she is a driving force behind the organization's strategic vision, operational direction, and overall management. So you bring that strategic perspective that Harold, again, was talking about in his keynote, and also this unwavering commitment to excellence that, that I love. Um, she's reached a pivotal point in her career when she's assumed the position of managing partner and, and through her leadership, this company has underwent a successful transformation in 2023. And if, you're, if your uh, microphone is on, please mute it. And, and she did that by securing private market investments and re-emerging as uh, Sintel Pharma. So she's, she's gone through these organizational changes. She brings this wealth of experience in, in, in strategic vision and direction. And she's a serial entrepreneur. And we're going to find out why that's really, really important. With and she's got two decades of experience in pharmaceuticals, biotechnology. You know, with all of these folks, I could spend hours talking about their bona fides, but we don't have time. But her journey began as a student at Yale School of Public Health. You know, and and so she she knows a thing or two, and she developed there this clinical research database, which I'm excited to hear about. Um, she has this diverse background, of it, which encompasses scientific and management roles across public and private enterprises, and, and, and that's really driven her, her entrepreneurial business acumen. And more important, with all this knowledge, she has not forgotten the human element of business and brings that empathy and understanding of the human condition, and, and really what's going on is, is empowering different uh, folks in, in around the world including more people that may feel left out. She really brings, uh, uh, you know, to diversity, equity, inclusion, her her experience that is so, so helpful. We're so glad to have you on the panel today, Yolanda. Welcome. Thank you for your generosity. Welcome. Thank you. So, so many, and, and, and of course we have Dr. Harold. You already heard about him. So Harold, is it okay if I pass on, on talking about you again? Absolutely. We know your bona fides already. Okay, let's start with one question, and I'm gonna start asking Joanna. This question to you is, as automation and AI continue to advance, how can project managers leverage these technologies to enhance project efficiency and effectiveness? You have one minute, go. Thank you, Spencer. I'd like to touch on three main things. The first one is the need for process review. It's important for project managers to really take time to um, assess the tasks and the processes to be able to segregate the ones that are repetitive. These ones are easily automated. And the another advantage of 
these assessments is the ability to determine the efficiency of your existing systems, uh, to be able to determine how they can interface with new systems that are coming. Number two, upscaling and rescaling. We can never overemphasize that. The world is changing very fast and as project managers we need to get better at what we do and then learn new skills to be able to fit in into the change. The last point I'd like to make is understanding the issues that come with automation and AI and other technologies. These issues include data availability, data quality, um, data security. It's important that as we work with this, we get to know these issues that are coming up. At the end of the day, we have to know as project managers that the responsibility of the accuracy of every outcome depends on us. So let's get to understand the issues. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you. And this is what we're going to do. We are going to hit fast, hard, and quick. So please have your questions ready. And I want, Harold, would you add to what Joanna has said? What is really, as this continues to advance, how what would you add to this conversation my issue is with the legal aspect how do you know whether the information that you're using is copyrighted and what happens if your customers tell you that they're so worried they don't want you to use any ai information on their projects the legal issues are becoming critical thank you yolanda what would you add to that so I would add the regulatory aspect of it. Being based in Europe, for example, there are very um, strict regulations that have come about due to these different advancements in technology that impact uh, the work environment. So I would say regulatory is a big one. Brilliant, thank you. So let, let's go into question number two. And, and I'm gonna throw this out to Amini. So what are, and we'll give others a chance, but what are the key skills and competencies that project managers will need to thrive in the future of work? And how can they acquire and develop these skills? Thank you, Spencer, for this question. I would start with my favorite one, which is really ethics. There will be lots of ethical consideration as we have more complex and strategic programs and direction. One of the main things is really um, every, in every project there will be part of ESG that will be transparent in terms of the procurement, fair procurement practices, social responsibility and sustainable practices, transparency, and that will enable us to build trust with our stakeholders, our customers and our teams. These are the main things. Uh, the other ones is really understanding data, the privacy and the security to avoid any sort of cyber attacks. And as we collect data, we need to be wary of the consequences of making it available and the decisions we make accordingly that will be touching on privacy, security and the decisions we make from an ethical perspective. Amani, I want to I want to put you on the spot here. So I, you talked about several skills, but one of the skills you said is ethics. How do you develop ethics as a skill? Um, very interesting question. I will start with the basics as PMI code of ethics and professional conduct. The four values that we have are responsibility, respect, fairness, and honesty. And that is inclusive of our responsibility towards the environment and the resources we're given, as well as the conflict of interest. Now, we have to translate our behavior, our core uh, values into our behaviors. And that's something that we as leaders need to practice on daily basis in every decision we make. We have uh, in PMI a number of tools and um, resources that will enable project managers to tap into increase their awareness of their ethical values and behaviors, as well as uh, use for ethical decision making. This is a must. So, uh, in terms so what I'm hearing you say management. is, I'm hearing you say that they really, people really need to become aware of what those uh, ethical standards are. And so it's a matter of studying them and seeing if they are in alignment with that, because if they're not, that's gonna create some problems for them going in, in the future of work. Is that correct? Ex exactly yeah. right. And practices will enable that, yep. Thank you. So 
here are a few of the skills that are are known in addition to what Amini has said that are absolutely crucial to learn in the future. I'm going to ask the panelists to rate each of these on a scale from one to 10 in terms of their importance. The first one is adaptability and change management. Number two, digital literacy. Number three, data analysis. Number four, collaboration and team leadership. Number five, communication skills. Number six, emotional intelligence. And number seven, entrepreneurial skills. And number eight, PM and ESG skills. Amini, what does ESG stand for? Economic, social, and governance. And that's really about our awareness of, we're talking about climate change, for example. We're talking about procurement ethical standards. We're talking about conflict of interest. We're talking so about transparency. Yes, that encapsulates the ethics that you just described. Yes? Yes, it does. Okay, great. So by on a, I'm going to ask each of you individually, how would you rate as a level of importance for project managers for future skills to develop adaptability and change management? Joanna, scale from 1 to 10. 1 being the lowest, 10 being the highest. 10. Very important. Excellent. Nadun? I too rate it at 10, Spencer. Okay, Amini. Nine. Nine. Harold. Okay, Harold's on mute. Yolanda. Ten. Okay, <laughs> Yolanda, what would you rate it? So uh, I'm going to skew it a little bit for you, and I'm just going to rate it an eight. And why do you do that? You know, I. I so a couple of weeks ago, I, I gave a lecture on uh, the future of work for project management. And one of the things that was very striking to me in our discussion with, with uh, this panel of a group of people was that there is a key change that's driving the way of work in the future among project managers, especially in big corporations. And that is that we're looking more for project managers to have a switch in their brain and work in terms, start thinking more uh, um, in an entrepreneurial way. So this is a very key aspect of the way of working in the future. So you're so so you're going to skew entrepreneurship higher. I see where you're absolutely. going with this. All right. I, I, I absolutely <laughs> will. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, let's get to the second one. Digital literacy. Yolanda, scale from one to 10. Uh, the 10. Uh, Joanna, one to 10. Digital literacy. 10. Nadun. Yeah, it is at 10 because without any digital literacy, we cannot move in future. Omni. I'll give it another nine. A nine. Harold. 10. So, Amini, why are you rating it nine? Everyone else rated it at a ten. I think because I want to keep the ten for something that I think is much <laughs> more important. <laughs> you you just naturally don't give things a, a ten automatically. I see. You, yes, I'll, I got you. All right. High standards. That's that ethics. Uh, there she has. All right. All right. Next, yeah. data yeah. analysis. <laughs> Say again, Harold. I give data analysis a five. That's why you have team members. OK, hold on. Uh, I, I want to come back to that five. Uh, Joanna, data analysis. I'll give it seven. A, a seven. Now, dude, what do you give it? I'll give it around six. Six. Yolanda. I, I give it a seven. OK. Amini. Seven. Okay, we've heard a little bit from Harold. Nadon, why did you rate it as a six? Uh, why I rated it at six, Spencer, because data analytics, the data is available, but technology and the people are there to analyze and present it. So analytic is a different uh, part, but the automation is there for you to analyze and give. So data is important, but the automation is on top of that is the most important. That's why I rated it at six. You know, I hope you guys, whoever's listening, everyone that's listening, appreciate how quickly they're coming. They're on their toes. We've got a question coming in that we're going to get to in a second. But let's do the rest of these skills. Collaboration and team leadership. Yolanda, start with you. One to ten. 
I give that a eight. Harold, uh, collaboration 20. and team leadership. You give a it a 20. 20. Yes. <laughs> you said in your keynote, you, you highlighted collaboration in part of your keynote. We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. Nadun, collaboration. I give you that and, and nine. I give you that nine. Nine. Joanna. Uh, ten asterisks. <laughs> and I, uh, I agree with Dr. Harold Kesma. Okay, 20. Uh, Amini. Nine. nine, another nine. nine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start with you, Yolanda. You rated this an eight. Tell us why you rated it as an eight. It's the first number that came out of my head. No, just kidding. <laughs> it was it was simply because, you know, with collaboration and team leadership, you need to forge your team to go in the right direction. But I think it, overall, some of these uh, numbers kind of come even uh, towards each other. And, and it's basically just an interesting number to me. You're just you're just attempting to create some some differentiation and yeah. some variance and because I'm everything if, if everything is important then nothing is important is what I'm hearing you say is that right? It's sort of you know I what I what, what I'd like to see is collaboration and team leadership aligned with emotional intelligence. God, well, we're getting and, into emotional intelligence. That's a, that's one of the other skills. We'll come back to that. So what you would do is put those all together. It's sort of, yeah. <laughs> And listen, if, if I'm simplifying it, you stop me and, and say, hey, Spencer, come on, let's ask a better question here and tell me what that is. But uh, OK, Harold, why 20? Projects are managed by people. They're not managed by tools and techniques. If you're a project manager, you should believe in what I call servant leadership. There are other names for it. In other words, if you're a project manager, do the people on the team work for you or do you work for them? The answer is you work for them. Your job is leadership to motivate them and get them to do their job effectively. You can always get people on your team to analyze data. Your job is to motivate the people in the team, get them to work as a team and get them to make the right decision. They can analyze all the data. The reason why we got in trouble for years is as project managers didn't realize that they were paid for leadership. They thought they were paid to analyze data, and that was it. Now it's finally getting reversed. You know, I had the uh, I had the privilege of speaking at a conference just last month in Indonesia, PMI uh, conference, and there was uh, Dr. Joshua Neto. Maybe some of you know him from Malaysia. Uh, brilliant. Uh, individual and and uh, he was talking after he heard me speak he says you know i used to be so good at completing the project and these are his words i would get it done on time on budget but there were blood all over the walls and nobody ever wanted to work with me again after that project <laughs> and so he was unable to sustain that productivity because he would just you know it was killing the teams as you were telling your story Doctor, I mean, Harold, you were telling the story about no one wanting to work because there was no life balance. The same thing is very, very true. And he has since learned. And and it, but that was his story about how he had to learn. It's not about the, the project on budget and, and just those metrics. It's about the ability to sustain that. OK, let's go to communication skills very, very, very quickly. Communication skills one to ten. Uh, Amini, one to ten. Another nine. <laughs> Another nine. Nadun. Uh, I'll give 10. Yolanda. I'll give it a 10. Joanna. I give it a 9. Harold. 10. <laughs> okay, jo uh, Yolanda, now you've got some great and you've got some scoring inflation going on. Why do you rate communication so high? Uh, I think, you know, open and transparent communication is key in any function that you're in. It will always be rated 10 in my scale. Excellent. Thank you for that very concise and wonderful answer. Emotional intelligence, one to 10. Let's see. Let's start with you, Joanna. 10, absolutely. How many? <laughs> emotional ten, intelligence. I will, that's yeah. the one that needs 10. Yeah. Finally, we got a 10 out of, OK. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you that nine. 
Nine. Harold. Ten. Okay, Amini, why did you rate this a ten? Why did you break with your own rules here? Yeah, I think because this is the most critical in terms of understanding the environment, understanding your team, understanding your stakeholders, and therefore it's going to influence every other talent and skill that you're going to need, whether it's communication, whether it's collaboration, whether it's leadership, because you're aware and you can read the air around you. Excellent. Okay, uh, let's go to entrepreneurial skills, Yolanda. You can go a higher than 10 if you want. Yeah, I, I, I would go, as Harold said, I would go for the 20. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, it's a given. It's everywhere. I, I interview a lot of um, managers and directors and, and C-suites, and it is a key aspect of how we run a, a, a business. <laughs> So you know, I think it's an important sure. aspect and managers, I think a lot of managers have the tenacity and skills uh, of an entrepreneurial person. They just need to leverage how they apply these skills to their work. Yeah, I know that's really interesting. Some some project managers may be listening, say, listen, I, I didn't sign up to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> but what you're saying is, is they, Right, they already have some of those. It's the skills. It's, you don't actually have to. Have, you you manage risk within your within your job, but you, learning those skills will be absolutely invaluable. Is what you're saying? Correct. Joanna, one to ten. Ten. Amini. Ten. Nadun. Ten. Harold. Ten. Okay, last one. P, uh, project management and ESG skills. Let's start with you, Amini. I'll give that a nine. A nine? I thought you were going to say like 12 and a half. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I have nothing above 10. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna. 10. Yolanda. I'm going to give it a 10. Okay. And Nadun. 10. Harold. 10. Okay, I think we've had enough question on that. This next uh, discussion on that. The next question we have is from our audience. This is for you, uh, Nadun. How best can one combine automation with stakeholder management in respect to communication management? Uh, if all understand the communication is, uh, for me, in the project management, number one. Stakeholders, what they want is they want accurate, timely information uh, the simple reason being they want to see the status at their fingertips and where the project directs and if there are any uh, correction to be done on time, they want to take actions. So how automation supports it? Now, uh, if you think little 10 years back, a lot of the things you have to do manually, but with the AI coming to the picture, everything is on a fingertip. You could have the dashboard, you can have the predictive analysis where it will be enable you to take the correct action. So this will enable proper communication with the stakeholders. So that's a very short answer. If something more descriptive you want, I could go ahead. Well, listen, I'll tell you what I, what I want from you, uh, Nadun. I, I don't know who asked this question, but obviously, there's an there, there's an issue of combining automation with stakeholder management and communication management. What do you think is behind the question? What are the problems that you see in your experience that show up in relation to these these things? Yeah, because a combination when you come, the stakeholder management comes with the communication we make to the stakeholders. It could be either with the reports or the dashboard, status, progress, everything. So where the automations come, this if you can combine with the automation, you could either use a tool or you could use uh, any uh, way of a AI compatible programs, then the automation will combine the stakeholder management with communication. Thank you. So I want to ask the panel, does anybody have experience or in your experience, have you experienced any pain in this in managing this, you know, communication management, with stakeholder management in terms of automation? Have you experienced any challenges? Anybody? No. OK, I'll that time's up. That. <laughs> Harold. OK, good. <laughs> Project managers now have the technology 
in order to create dashboards for individual stakeholders. One of the things that we teach project managers today is when you meet with a stakeholder, don't ask them what information they want to see. Ask them what decisions they have to make, and then you provide them with the metrics and information for the decisions that they have to make. If you ask a stakeholder what information do they want to see, they'll say every metric you have in your library, mm -hmm. and that's going to drive you insane. You ask so stakeholders this, that today. Is, that, that is a perfect segue, Harold, to our next question, and that is when I was asking everyone about the skills that needed to be developed on a scale from one to ten, one of our listeners suggested everything can't be all important all the time. And so that individual wanted you to rank those skills. So I'm going to list them again, and I want you to rank those from most important to least important from your perspective, okay? So we're going back to the skills, and they are adaptability and change management, digital literacy, data analysis, collaboration and team leadership, communication, emotional intelligence, entrepreneurial skills, PM and ESG skills. So you get to rank those from most to least. Who wants to start? Raise your hand. Who is eager to go? Awesome, Joanna. Way to listen. Okay. Teacher's pet. This is amazing. Go ahead. I still stick to my nine. And let me give a, a reason. Communication is important, but the person doing the communication, that factor of one I didn't add is the person who will be doing the communication. It's absolutely important, the ability of the person to be able to differentiate stakeholders, to be able to categorize them and know this communication works for these stakeholders. It's also really key. So that's why I withheld my one, because the person doing the communication is an important factor. Thank you. Rank order them, Nadun. Rank order those. Okay, so adaptability, still 10, digital literacy, 10. Um, okay, data. hold on. Uh, let me, uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, Joanna. In okay. order of importance, so from there's, how many did I give you? Like eight of them? Which is the most, okay. which would you put first, second, third, all the way down? Okay. So emotional intelligence would come first. Number one. Yep. Yes. Entrepreneurial skills would come second. Second. Collaboration and team leadership will come third. Adaptability, I would put it at fourth. I want to read this. Okay, field. so that, that is great. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you, what's your number one and what's your last? Hey, Nadun, what is the most important and what is the least important on that list to you? Uh, for me, the most important is the adaptability. Uh, the least important is the data analysis. Brilliant. Thank you, Amini. Most important, least important. Most important is emotional intelligence, and least important is data analysis. Excellent. Yolanda, most important, least. I second what um, uh, Amini said, for sure. Excellent. Uh, Harold. Harold. Most important, least. Okay, we're moving on. <laughs> Number, uh, another question. This is from a, uh, one of our participants today. What is your team's perspective on integrating artificial intelligence into project management? How do you envision AI enhancing processes and outcomes? Uh, let's see, who am I gonna ask this to? Give me a hint. Nadun. Yeah, uh, uh, Spencer, if you can repeat the question again, I could answer. Yes, it says, what is your team's perspective on integrating artificial intelligence into project management? How do you envision envision AI enhancing processes and outcomes? Right. Uh, if I take that uh, question, now, when you take AI, 
uh, most of the repetitive tasks uh, done by the project managers now can be automated because then we, uh, project managers will have their time to more focus on the uh, human aspects of the leadership to drive the projects. Then the second thing what I will say is with the AI available, we could go ahead with the predictive analysis, which will give a in deep understanding what the project outcome will be in future. Then apart from that, uh, for the resource allocation also, uh, we could use a lot of AI capabilities to use the resource at its maximum. And uh, again, another aspect is on the risk management side. Those are the four key areas what I think uh, we'll add from the AI to the project management uh, discipline. I love the fast, concise answer. Well, well done. Yolanda, I have a question just for you. Sure. Okay, the question is, could you share insights into ongoing initiatives to incorporate artificial intelligence into your organization's project management um, practices? What specific strategies are being employed to maximize the benefits of this technology? So there's different technologies out there uh, nowadays, right? I think incorporating different platforms in, in the space that I am, for example, we integrate different programs and have licensing agreements with different providers to integrate what's available out there in order to run certain um, uh, requests from our, our stakeholders or other managers that we're managing in different projects. So that's one of the things that we do specifically. Now, in terms, in terms of how to manage this, I think it becomes more challenging. I think AI is, is just one way, but one of the things that you see most out there is machine learning, which is a technology that's being implemented a lot across different channels, especially within the pharmaceutical and biotech space. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we hear so much about how is AI affecting the future of work. I want to know how you think, and this is this is my question for the panel. How is AI affecting our sense of self? And I'm talking about how does it impact you and me? And and let me share with you where I'm going. If if anyone studied marketing in in the '60s in the United States, there was this research that was done. There were cake makers, you know, like Betty Crocker, if you've ever heard of Betty Crocker cake mixes, I don't know if you have that product in, in your country, but think of a, a pre-mixed cake that comes, a uh, cake mix that comes in a box. They made it so simple that all you had to do was add water. People did not like that because they felt like it was cheating. It felt like they weren't doing any of the work. And so as in their research, what they did is they made people add one ingredient. They took out the, the pre-mixed egg, and they say, add water and an egg. Now all of a sudden people felt good about themselves because they were doing something. So my question to you is, is how I use ChatGPT almost every single day. I used it in, in creating marketing plans and ideas and messaging and, and podcasting. Is there a problem, number one, with how it impacts ourself about how we work and what we accomplish, number one? And number two, what do you find as, it, let's say you're applying for a bank loan, because we have some banking experts, right? And I apply for a bank loan and an AI algorithm determines whether or not I get that loan. If I get the loan, does the automated system tell me, and what is that? How does that impact me as a customer versus hearing from a human? Number two, or if I don't get the loan, is there a difference in how I receive the negative news as a human? Do you understand where I'm going with this? Let's add some of the human element to AI. Who wants to tackle that question? I'll tackle it first. Excellent. It it's not a matter of bringing in the technology. It's a matter of people feeling that they're removed from their comfort zones. You've got people that are working on project teams that have done the same job, the same activity for maybe decades. You have stakeholders that have worked the same way with clients and contractors for years. They are worried about being removed from their comfort zone. Anytime you bring in something like AI, you have to let people know what the expectations are about their performance as a result of bringing this in. 
because you're removing people from comfort zones. That's critical. You know, Harold, you're not only moving, removing them from comfort zones, you actually are removing positions. Five years ago, my, a good friend of mine is a manager for Deloitte, you know, a major organization, worldwide organization. And they uh, integrated into their uh, contract management process an algorithm. I forget the name of it, what it's called. They named it some name five years ago. And basically, that is the work that, that interns used to do and learn the business. They would come into the business and they would review all the contracts. Well, that's now no longer available to them. So those are jobs that are being taken to develop, uh, you know, uh, contractors and, and 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 managers within Deloitte that no longer exist. So some people are 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 truly nervous. I just want to know also from the rest of you how does it how does using when, let's say we do change and we adapt and we use AI how does that impact our sense of self. And how does it impact our end users when they experience our services delivered through AI versus a human? Uh, Joanna, thank you. I would like to start from the impact on ourselves. Um, realistically, irrespective of how senior you are, whenever you are informed of automation, um, you have a feeling that is the beginning of the process, that something is going to change. And so it makes you understand that the people who you are leading would have a more intense feeling about it. And so, for instance, when you work in a bank, you know, the operations department of the bank is quite repetitive. And so anytime the operations unit hear that we are going to automate the processes, in as much as they are not going to lose their jobs, you realize that there is fear. Um, what uh, there is, there are these two terms I've come to um, get acquainted with: cheerleaders and fear leaders of change. And so, whenever these things are coming, you have to be as a leader to be able to communicate the insecurities that come with it. You need to be able to get the team to relax. And then the second part of it is, it is, it is AI is redirecting our efforts. And as a leader, if you are able to communicate this clear and certainly to your team, it minimizes the anxiety. AI and automation redirect our efforts from the repetitive tasks and release time for us. That is a, a very good um, concept PMI is preaching. And it's very true. It releases you from the repetitive task and give you more time to learn leadership. As Kesna said, most project managers started from tasks and processes, inputs and outputs. And now we are forced to go into leadership. There are project managers and project directors now having to go to C-suite and all of a sudden you find yourself not being ready. And so that is the advantage of AI redirecting our efforts into leadership. Thank you, Spencer. Are you saying Are you that technology can help bridge the gap with our leadership experience? Is that what I heard you say? Exactly. Okay, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a wrinkle at you. You know this little technology piece that I have in my hand right here is a supercomputer. I I argue that this thing is making me stupid. <laughs> because I rely more and more on this technology and I become less and less capable. I can't even remember phone numbers. Why? Because it's all done for me. Is there anything to that? So my sense of self is I can't function without my technology. It's like the movie The Matrix. I need to download how to lead her, you know, in my head. Okay, now I can lead. That's what I heard you say. <laughs> yes. And, and okay, I think it's Amity important. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. I, I want to mix it up a little bit here. Amini, what do you say yeah. to that? You raised your hand, then Yolanda, I come to you. I, well, my worry is really the dependency that we have, as you said, on this level of technology, where it's taking out from us the ability to decipher and maybe in the future, even the decision making process where there's no empathy, there's no um, consideration for special circumstances and artificial intelligence is as good as the people who programmed it where unconscious bias will be filtered through to the AI as we go and progress with machines and intelligence 
being more and more dependent on, on them. So for me, we need to be careful and conscious of what this is going to produce for us in the future and making sure that we're more aware, we're able to decipher and catch up and like on empathy and unconscious bias as much as possible. Amini, I'll tell you what, I love this because it's creating more job security for me as somebody that teaches communication and leadership <laughs> because we're losing, we're, those skills are beginning to atrophy when we, when we rely too much on technology. Yolanda, what were you going to say? I was just going to add that, you know, we just need to practice a balancing act. You need to be able to balance the benefits and the challenges of AI as we're confronting these uh, disruptions that are occurring in our daily lives. So I think that's essential to, to get a grasp of in order to have sort of a, a, a positive self-image of yourself on how you operate during um, these uh, platforms, uh, throughout these platforms that you're working with. Yes. So I want to I, I want to add to that. I was going to do a, a poll of this or that, and the poll was if if anybody listening, and I'm going to I'm going to reference some Hollywood movies, and so forgive me, maybe you've heard of them. One is Terminator, right? There was this this uh, co corporation called Skynet, and they were the fear is is that Skynet created this technology that basically the machines took over the world. You had Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator. The second option is the future going to be Skynet, or is it going to be more like Bucky, if you've ever watched uh, the Marvel movies, he's the, the winter soldier, right? And he has this, this bionic arm. In my opinion, the future is going to be more like that. Technology is there to enhance our capabilities, not replace. And we cannot rely on technologies. You talked about decision making, right, Joanna and, and, and Omni. We have to consult with these technologies, but not use them ultimately, remove our responsibility for leadership, communication, and decision making. Never, and that speaks to what Harold was talking about earlier in terms of copywriting. We can certainly read books. We can certainly read what we see in, in, in you know, generative AI question answers, but ultimately we have to create our own content, our own decisions. That's what I'm hearing you all say. Exactly right. Yes. Okay. Hopefully this is getting exciting for our listeners. Let's see what other questions that we have. Um, let's see. Who haven't we heard from in a moment? Uh, I'm going to, let's see. I'm, Yolanda, I, I think I asked you a, an AI question. Harold, let me, let me throw this one to you. From your viewpoint, how is AI shaping the evolution of project management? What changes do you anticipate in terms of efficiency decision-making and innovation within the profession as the technology continues to advance. So building on what we've just said, what would you go? I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, very short. Harold? <laughs> okay, he's on, let's... Uh, he's on, Harold, you're on mute. <laughs> All right, Yolanda, take it. Do you want me to say it again? I'm sorry. I was just looking at. I was looking at. I have three screens in front of me. So Harold's on <laughs> mute, and I'm saying, trying to tell Harold that he's on mute. <laughs> yeah. No, we gotta we gotta manage our technology, folks. Um, <laughs> sorry. From your viewpoint, uh, what I said was that AI is never gonna replace a project manager's ability to make the final decision. AI is a tool. It's a tool to provide information to project teams, not to replace the project manager. Thank you for that. That Anybody disagree with that? Who can give us, okay, who can add to that? It's the ability uh, if I of just the Please okay, go, ahead. Go, go ahead, Nadun. Amini, I'll come back to you. Nadun, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if I to add, I uh, totally agree with uh, Doctor because uh, technology cannot uh, replace the importance of a project manager, but technology always could support in the decision making, providing certain data and guidelines only. So I totally agree with the comment. Brilliant, Amini. Really quickly, you have t ten words. 
Same here, decisions making, we need to take responsibility for the decisions we make or we do not make. And therefore, back to the ethics in terms of deciphering what is presented in front of us as PMs. Excellent. So this is a question. We have, uh, our time is running out. We have less than 10 minutes. I would like to hear um, just a quick hitting one breath answer from each of you. What advice do you give to current project managers to future proof your careers? Uh, let's start with you, Joanna. How do you future proof your career? You need to upscale. Joanna or Yolanda? It's beginning to sound. <laughs> <laughs> That was a ventriloquism, uh, uh, Yolanda. That is really amazing. I'm coming to you, Yolanda. Joanna. Okay. Prepare for growth. And you prepare for growth by learning leadership, getting very good at emotional intelligence. And then when you are rising to management position to C-suite, you would be ready. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yolanda, what do you think? I think stay curious but always upscale. Amani. Continue your journey of self-growth as much as possible. Whatever gap you have, ensure that you fulfill it, whether for yourself or someone within your team. Excellent. Nadun. Yeah, future project management sh should be focusing on their power skills like communication, the leadership. Then apart from that, they should have the culture specific leadership also. They have to embrace the diversity and the inclusion. Uh, Harold. Three words, education, education and education. Brilliant. You know, you talk about upskilling, several of you, Joanna, you started with upskilling. The latest Har uh, our, um, Harvard Business Review says reskilling in the age of AI, if anybody is interested. So my question that I have in regards to that, one of the things that they mention is the average ha <coughs> half-life. Think of that word, the half-life, that means how long it's going to live, of technical skills is now less than five years in some technical fields and as low as two and a half years. What is the best way, you talk about upskilling, what is the best way to upskill for project managers and for organizations? Because organizations have to upskill all of their uh, of their employees. It can't, so how do we do that? Who, who wants to tackle that? How do you upskill? Yes, Yolanda. So I think successful upskilling initiatives often align with organizations' goals, right? What is the bottom goal that you want to accomplish within your organization? And individual needs. So I think providing relevant and practical training is very important. You, in order to be successful, there needs to be continuous support from your management, clear communication, this is back to emotional intelligence as well, and a culture that values learning. So if you want to upscale, you need to be in an environment where that's going to be accepted. I think that's very important. I, I can't hear you, Spencer. We can't oh, hear I you, Oh, I thought Spencer. I unmuted myself. Thank you for uh, calling me out. Um, we have so little time. You know, we have such a diverse audience. Right now, we have people from all over the world. So let's talk about a little bit in, in terms of differences in uh, how different cultures deal with some of these issues. So let's, uh, let me see, as, uh, blah, 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 blah. how does working across cultures and time zones impact inclusivity and diversity initiatives. Yolanda, this is one that I think that uh, you, I'd like you to start with. Uh, think, we've been talking about best practices for project managers, but take that working across cultures, time zones, and the impact of inclusivity and diversity initiatives. Yeah, I think time zones um, add always a little bit of complexity to inclusivity and diversity initiatives. Communication styles is also uh, something that's very key. It becomes more normal, I think, in, 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 in the way of working. Um, also requiring um, a heightened awareness of how you, uh, what the expectations are. 
Uh, time zones in different areas may create challenges based on real time collaboration, potential, potentially even excluding team members when you're communicating. I think that's always a very uh, a challenging thing. Um, however, being proactive and putting efforts in to accommodate diverse schedules, using different communication tools, um, fostering global mindset enhances always with an organization, I think it enhances inclusivity. Uh, you know, you have diversity, equity, and inclusion for a reason. And I think if you want to have a happy environment, be more inclusive. Thank you. And Joanna, I see you nodding and wanting to add to that, don't you? Uh, I want to add briefly that uh, if you are a team leader, it's important to be culturally aware of the composition of your team. Communication is perceived differently by different um, settings. And so you may not be able to cover all areas, but it's important to know the people you are dealing with, their cultural expectations of the project they are in so that you would be able to communicate and create harmony. Thank you. Thank you. I am deciding what would be our, maybe our last question here. Um, in the future, which roles in project teams could be most impacted by emerging technologies? So this is, you know, different different areas in project management. Which do you think will have the, you know, be impacted the most by emerging technologies? Who'd like to tackle that one first? Nadun, thank you. Okay, I'll take the question. Two roles mainly will get impacted uh, according to my estimation. The first is the role of the project manager. Project manager you can't replace, but project manager will be supported by a lot of automated the information, everything to handle his job much in an easy way. But the decision making always uh, relies with the project manager's ability. The second one is on the project sponsor where the timely decisions could be taken with the available technology. So these two roles will mainly impact with the technology development in the project management field in future. Can I just I add- I love the short- that? Yes, please do. So, so I, I just wanna add one very important thing. As a leader in, in an organization, I think one of the things that we find, at least in the, in the space that, that I'm in, is the administrative um uh, role so such such things as data entry data analysis basic analysis those things have become more automated so i think that um you know leadership project managers are here to stay you're not going to lose your job let's make that very clear <laughs> nobody's going to lose their job if anything we're going to need more project managers Yes, and I and I love that. So as we have like a minute, and a, actually a minute left, is there anything that you would like to say that I didn't ask you or the audience didn't ask you that we just have to end with? You've got 10 seconds to say it. Nadun, what, what, did, what would you want to say that we haven't said? I think uh, maybe we can add a small title for project manager calling digital project manager in future. Excellent. Jo Joanna, what would you say? 10 seconds. What? How would you okay. leave? What, 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 what haven't I asked you? I'm reading a quote. When we consider the scope of the challenge to prepare for the future of work, it is important to understand that many children currently in primary school will work in jobs as adults that do not exist today. World Development Report 2019. As project management, we may have to work in roles that don't exist today a year from now. So let's get ready. Thank you. Love that. Amini. Uh, I, I want to touch on the legal aspects. What we call the legal aspects today, I think, are more ethical issues that everyone needs to be aware of, regardless of the legality within their own countries. So if we consider ethical uh, decisions, ethical data, dealing with things ethically, we will be on the top of our game. Excellent. Harold, a few seconds. Project, project management is no longer a career path. Instead, it's one of the four or five strategic competencies that companies need in order for the company to survive. It's been elevated from a career path to a strategic competency. Yes, Yolanda, the last word. I had to unmute, sorry. 
Yes, I, I think that was really beautifully said, Harold. And I'll just add to that by saying, let's all embrace the platforms. Love that. Thank you so much for your energy today. Thank you for allowing me to be your moderator. Thank you for coming. Priya, I turn it back over to you, hopefully on time. Yes, of great course. job, Spencer. Just on time, Spencer. And well good job, everyone. A big pat on the back, virtual pat on the back for yourself. And we have uh, wonderful uh, comments wonderful. on the chat window, but I will hand it over to Anita to take us through the last segment of the event. Anita? Yes, yes. Uh, hello again. So, in the beginning of the event, we introduced you to the exchange effect map. And now what we present you on the screen is how diverse our participation in the event is sourced from the Mentipol that you took. So very, very much diverse audience. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And now the result of our new session attendee spotlight uh, thank you so much all for participating, for pasting your questions, for comments, for your excellent insights. Your engagement was amazing. We received many comments and quotes. And the chosen one is by uh, Vinod Krishna. Um, Vinod said, PMs need storytelling abilities to bring together stakeholder management, communication and automation. Thank you so much for sharing this insight with us. And now over to Tao for outro section of the event. Okay, uh, hold on a minute. Let me see how to share this. Okay, see my screen? Yes. Hey, hey, can, you, can you hear me? Okay, then I will go. And so, so this event will very will have a three hundred fifty uh, maximum uh, participation uh, actually, and we have over five fifty nine uh, country involved and five continents. And so, and for this event, and the the great core for Dr. Harold is that you are not managing a project, but you are managing the business. That's that's the that's what they call the the most of. As most of us in the bill, and for the chapter, the chapter highlight the PMI Poland chapter. Well, there's lots of things highlights, and it's quite similar to Taiwan actually. For this from where my country is, let's make a social impact. Power, power young men, and we do have the similar things. And uh, translating the PM box to Polish, and we do have translate to Mandarin the traditional Chinese, and uh, 20th anniversary, and the silver marketing and. The finally, the, the the future, and we are kind of the, the points we are taking is the flexibility, and this is the key thing everybody talking about. How to make a change? How to how how to make a change change movements? And everything is going to be changed. It's not going to be steady. So we are not going to do know the future, and we cannot predict the future. So that's the thing. And undertaking, and we have undertaking the reliability and the, the for the all the other uh is ethical problems. That's all the project management have to do. And also about the true agility, Dr. Harold mentioned, we have to be the true, uh, the, the more agile is not a waterfall anymore, and we are going to change our way of working. And also unleash, we're going to, uh, going to unleash the uh, collaborations and leadership skills and power skills and uh, to make sure that we are going to be the future. And also, we are going to revolution, revolutionizing. It's not going to be the old way of working. It's not going to be not going to waterfalls. And we're going to, to make a new kind of way of working and we have new changes. And we are not going to lose our job. And finally, the the most I think the most important thing that everybody mentioned is entrepreneur uh, skills. And that's the that's what we hear most. And also happen in in Taiwan as well. We, we heard about lots of people. Just one people company, uh, one person company, and just running over the world. So, so that's that's about my ending here. Thanks. Okay, Thank you, Tao. Thank you, Tao. And I also would like to say big thank you to our fantastic panelists of the event, Joanna, Yolanda, Amani, Nadun, and Dr. Harold. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
And Spencer, big thank you to you for moderating the session, uh, for accepting the invitation. And our attendees, uh, please take your feedback by scanning the QR code or through the link that I believe will be uh, pasted in the, in the chat. Please share the topics you would like to hear on uh, on our feedback link. And also, I would like to say a big thank you to our team, chapter exchange team, uh, working behind the scenes. Uh, thank you to Sunil and Amot for your help as team's admin in making this event uh, as smooth as ever. And big thank you to our chapter liaisons. In fact, we have 42 of them in our team uh, working for putting this event together. Thank you so much again, our attendees, panelists, our team working together around the clock to make this event yet another success. PDU code is displayed on the screen and a mailer will be sent out with the details as well on how to claim the PDUs. Over to you, Priya. Uh, so thank you, Anita. And yes, this was the last event of the year. So everyone, uh, we really uh, thank you for attending this session and supporting us for the last four years. We again thank you for giving your time and attention today. We will be back in 2024. So do follow our social media handles for more. Till then, stay safe, stay healthy, and hope to see you soon somewhere, 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 someday in this world, right? Okay, so with this, bye-bye. See you again in 2024. Bye.